something better. Let me <laughs> not forget to begin the, the recording. Okay, now I go to share screen. Uh, this, uh, share. And, uh, uh, yeah, the PowerPoint presentation, Adalberto Libera. So we really have a chance if you are patient with me and with uh, with uh, um, you know the, the 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 avalanche of many many celebrations because almost every day a genius was born and we are not going to uh, ignore anybody. So we are supposed to say happy birthday to all great architects. In fact, there was today another birthday of a collaborator of Venturi Scott and Brown. But because I have an issue with the Venturi Scott and Brown, and also because I didn't have enough time to prepare three presentations, I have to leave him uh, aside for now. But uh, maybe uh, under the pressure of the general public, I will, I will do something for tomorrow. So actually today, we were supposed to have three presentations, but we'll have only two. But, but then I announced only one, so it's a treat anyway. Okay, we begin from the beginning. I imagine you do see the, 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 the first page of the presentation. Adalberto Libera, 1903-1963. So he, died, he could have lived longer. And you can find on the web a very interesting interview with his daughter. Uh, and and the, the name of, uh, of the article is uh, um, Adalberto Liberta, my father, where she says important and interesting things about her father. Okay, so uh, uh, why is it that I, here it was supposed to be a picture with him? Strange. Uh, anyway, I'm sorry about this. I, I, I don't know what happened to that picture. So this is an early work by him from 1933. So uh, he was 30 years old when he did his work. He is considered, on one hand, a rationalist, uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, a fascist, a fascist architect. And on the third one, uh, a futurist. Now, the Italian futurism uh, uh, was, uh, was uh, an interesting phenomenon, and there were very interesting artists and poets, if we are not to neglect um, the great Marinetti, who was actually the engine of the group, but there were great uh, other great, uh, um, uh, you know, great artists associated and great architects, even Antonio Santelia, or uh, uh, you know, uh, um, I used to know uh, the, some important artists. Uh, the, the futurist, I like futurism. It is active. It is uh, it is vital. It is uh, risk taking. And unfortunately, some of them died very young in the war because they welcomed the war. They, the, the ideology was that war is, uh, is, is a good thing in the sense that it activates our energies. Uh, as I said, artists and even intellectuals are naive. They were, they were advocating uh, a vitality for which they paid with their, their own lives. So they must be forgiven. Boccioni, for example, was a great futurist uh, artist. And uh, um, uh, Antonio Santelia died at 28 because of his foolishness to believe in the, you know, uh, the, the great virtues of war. But then on the other hand, even Heraclitus, the great uh, Greek philosopher, did believe in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the virtues of war, but I, I imagine at his time, he didn't think of the nuclear war, or he didn't even think of the war that, you know, is done with a, with a modern means of destruction, which are uh, diabolical. Okay, so this is a, a you know, so-called, uh, in, in a way, rationalist building, but, but you can see there are diagonals here, and there is a dynamism, so it's not, it's not a static, uh, uh, architecture. On the other hand, even the work of Giuseppe Terrani, which who was also a great uh, um, Italian architect, uh, you know, associated with uh, with modernism and 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 uh, one of the the pillars of modernism, but also one of the pillars of fascist architecture. Giuseppe Terrani was uh, uh, 
less playing with diagonals than um, uh, Adalberto Libera. This didn't make him a, a less interesting architect at all. In fact, Peter Eisenman, he was, uh, I have heard him in a conference saying, you know, I have a great collection of books and magazines on, on Giuseppe Terrani. I, I am a great, great fan of, of him. And, and, and I understand why. He was a, a very important architect. But back to Adalberto Libera. So this is the building, and I think it's not bad. I mean, you know, you could say, well, you know, uh, there are repetitions, there is a kind of an austere rhythm. Yeah, but there are also the betrayals on these two facades, left and right. And so um, I, 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 I think it's a good building that he built at, uh, at 30. So he was not, uh, <laughs> you know, he was not excessively old at all. Palazzo del Poste, uh, well, you know, a postal office in a way, you know, not so ample as the one done by uh, uh, Otto Wagner uh, in Vienna, but still uh, not so small either. Anyway, we move forward. Le Pietre di Roma. Uh, I like this detail. You see, with simple means, you can do incredible things. You know, it's it's uh, it's it's architecture. It's dynamic. It's uh, inciting. It's uh, it plays with light and shadow. The windows are a little bit, uh, you know, betraying the the obsessional grid. So it's fine. Okay, and here you see the you know you barely see actually the plan and the the elevations and section and anyway it's his first work and i think uh, we can uh, continue to tell him a heartfelt happy birthday based on looking on this first work uh, there are books published uh, of course the italians published many books and many nice books about many architectural works i recommend you now just came to my mind an architect who is totally unknown here but he's great Absolutely great. And in fact, I couldn't find his birthday, but maybe one of you will remind me to search further because I, from time to time uh, I get carried away about all these presentations and I forget some very important things. Mario Ridolfi. Mario Ridolfi was, was uh, in Italy he's, he's known, but I think he deserves to be known uh, uh, all over the world because he was truly a, a, an impeccable uh, architect, very, very interesting architect, who kind of was able to combine modernity with, um, even with a craft of drawing, if I can say so. He designed, he drew details so sensitively, you know, kind of like Carlos Scarpa, but Scarpa was a little bit uh, idiosyncratic and personal. Uh, Ridolfi, Right. Please search for Mario Ridolfi, and you will not regret. Okay, but back to back to uh, Adalberto Libera. Now Palazzina Ostia Mare, 1932-1934. So about the same time, uh, 30 years old. Uh, a very different building, of course. Um, you know, this is not a post office. But uh, it's interesting, no? It's, 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 it's symmetrical, it's clear, it's luminous, it's uh, even a little bit bombastic at the corners because of those balconies, uh, but it's, it's kept under control. And there are these details that are, uh, you know, uh, I would say uh, of, of, of good quality. Of course, you could say, well, what about that uh, that cantilevered uh, perpendicular uh, balcony? Uh, well, it's a little accent there, you know, something that uh, would discourage uh, other developers to, to, to come too close to that, uh, that, that facade of that building. Anyway, uh, you can see here, it needed some repair work, but uh, it's still alive. And I, as you can see, it was repaired. Uh, I want to say that Adalberto Libera, this is what I learned from his daughter, that his father, the, 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 the main interest of his father was to create uh, a 
so-called correct architecture. Now, what is a correct architecture? You know, it's an architecture that, uh, uh, you know, considering the way I am, I, I would rather discourage because, you know, correctness in art and in architecture too is problematic, you know. I mean, would you say about a building, this is a beautifully correct building? I mean, a painting? Uh, or, you know, uh, or would you say about a, a novel or a writing, it's a very correct novel? Or about a piece of music, this is a very correct symphony? Uh, but, but, um, in, in the case of architecture, and in the case of Adalberto Libera, who did take some some uh, freedom in uh, and manifested some freedom, poetical license, uh, if I can call it so, in his buildings, that word correct perhaps has to be understood differently. Not in the sense of not uh, betraying any rule or uh, no. He, in a way, you could have said he he wanted some kind of a perfection. So maybe the word um, the correct was not uh, totally well uh, chosen, but this facade is not bad, I think. Uh, it's, it's interesting, it's, uh, uh, it's engaging, and uh, it has an, uh, 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 an outgoing movement because of these balconies that uh, open up the building. And uh, you see here the dynamic aesthetics of the, of the futurists. Otherwise, the building, uh, of course, is, uh, is uh, very regular and so-called uh, under control. Now, an elementary school in Trento, and it is called Raffaello Sanzio. And Raffaello Sanzio was born, this year is a commemorative year, a very important year, I, I forgot, either, probably uh, either 500 years since he died, or uh, 450 or five. 550 since he was born is a very no no I think it's 500 years since he died we are talking about one of the three geniuses of Italy the other two being Michelangelo and Leonardo of course they had other geniuses but Raphael or Raffaello Sanzio was one of them and he was the youngest he died the youngest he died at 37 but he was not just a great 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 painter he was also a very, very good architect. And I read that he, at one time he was uh, the main architect in, in, uh, in Rome. And, uh, and uh, so he also contributed to the, to the San Pietro uh, in Rome, uh, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the center of, uh, of Christianity. Uh, and uh, in terms of paintings, if you go Let's hope the pandemic goes away. Uh, one day we'll be able again to travel. If we go to, to the Vatican, you'll see incredible paintings by Raffaello Sanzio. But we are now at the elementary school. I don't know, maybe Raffaello Sanzio was born in Trento. Uh, Trento. I, I didn't uh, double check. But it doesn't matter. I just tried to, to say a few words. In fact, I launched a few competitions for Raphael, uh, a house for Raphael just to pay homage to, to this truly quintessential uh, artist of the Renaissance. Uh, and the building by Adalberto Libera is not bad. Again, we have the unconventional uh, uh, provocative diagonal, and uh, I think uh, almost without doubt uh, there, there is a stair. Uh, and uh, you see those diagonals are very uh, resolute. And uh, the, on the other side, we have the orthogonal system. So it's fine. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's not a bad building at all. And you see the relationship between the staircase and the tower of the old uh, castle or whatever it is there. So it's some kind of a dialogue and some kind of a contextualism in a way, no? Uh, so uh, Adalberto Libera proves himself to be a, a worthy architect and the sensitive architect, even when he used a language, architectural language that was, uh, you know, uh, so-called rational and modern, but you see there is a certain uh, contextualism at work here. Yes, so um, 
uh, we could even talk a little bit about the, 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 the chosen colors, you know, it, it's not quite white, but it's close to white, the, the horizontal uh, um, body of, 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 of the building. And then you have the, the, the reddish one, and you wonder why is it a part reddish and the other one uh, almost white or light gray? Well, uh, I can uh, only speculate, and maybe my speculation is uh, adventurous, but maybe you know that in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, European alchemy, white or whiteness symbolized the feminine principle and redness symbolized the masculine principle, or whiteness symbolized the queen, the, the feminine principle, the queen, the moon, uh, uh, mercury, and water, and redness symbolized uh, the, the king, the sun, uh, fire, and, and sulfur. So I don't know if Adalberto Libera thought of alchemy, and it's not important actually, but instinctually maybe uh, he was uh, trying to unite the opposites in a way, you know, to have uh, the sun and the moon, uh, water and fire, the male and the female, and uh, maybe even sulfur and mercury. A digression, maybe wrong. Anyway, l'Esposizione Mondiale di Chicago. Uh, I, 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 I chose this inform. I, I, I chose this information from uh, from the the Italian um, uh, Wikipedia because it was more uh, uh, developed than the uh, the English language one. Here he worked, he worked with some collabor collaborators and Mario De Renzi, uh, an important architect himself, they did, but I only have, I think it was destroyed. I, I, you will see, you see the model, but you will see also a picture or two of this very modernistic uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, outgoing and, uh, uh, you know, assertive uh, uh, building. Uh, you see here in this postcard, uh, um, you know, colored picture. But when you think about the time, I mean, 1933, this is a building that if you build today, it would look all right. And here it is a picture of the building as it was. But as uh, human beings are notoriously foolish and they love to squander the resources of the earth, they destroyed it. Of course. You know, why not? And they destroyed everything, not just this building. I mean, every building, and probably there were some great buildings by great architects, because these, uh, these fairs usually engage creative energies of the highest order. <laughs> but who cares, you know? Uh, we bring the bulldozers in, and it doesn't matter it was done by Adalberto Libera, or I don't know who. We, 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 we demolish it. Sad, <clears throat> very sad, but it's done continuously. Il Palazzo del Littorio a Roma, Concorso. I don't know if I, 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 I found, uh, if I found a, a picture here. No, I didn't, and I apologize. Il Padiglione Italiano per l'Esposizione Mondiale di Bruxelles uh, is the Italian pavilion for the uh, World Exhibition in Brussels. 1935, also very modern and innovative. Look at it. Uh, it's uh, maybe a little bit too um, massive and, and a little bit uh, too proud of itself, uh, but uh, still not bad. It's, 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 it's a modern statement. I mean, look how people were dressed. And you compare with the building. The building is more modern than the, the, the clothing of, of people, you know. And this says something about the relationship between fashion and architecture. When architecture is brilliant or, or is forward looking or is, is, is uh, built by, uh, you know, open minded and, and adventurous and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, uh, visionary architects, it, it wins the battle with fashion because fashion is eph ephemeral. So the way people dressed in 1930, whenever, the 1935, you know, nobody dresses any longer like, like, like that today. But the building didn't age. Well, it was destroyed, but uh, uh, it did not have age. 
This is what I'm trying to say. Good art and good architecture doesn't age, even if materially they do age in a sense, you know, cracks appear, uh, restorations, restorations are necessary, but, but aesthetically and, and, and spiritually they do not age. And this is the power of art. And this is the power of architecture when it is good. While clothing and fashion, you know, what was, uh, what people were in, in 1935, <laughs> you know, in 1936, uh, they, uh, they would have been already obsolete. As uh, Oscar Wilde said, you know, fashion is so horrible and so, uh, so ugly that we have to change it every six months. Nice sarcasm. Uh, anyway, look at this building. If you build such a building today, it would be considered visionary or almost visionary. Not bad, Alberto Libera. We are proud of you. And again, happy birthday. Look at that pathetic car on the right, you know, and compare that car with, with our cars today. Cars, just like fashion, become obsolete after a short while. So this should say uh, some, uh, something to us about the difference between art, architecture, culture in, genera in general, and the pathetic objects which become, uh, uh, you know, uh, obsolete and, and uh, old fashioned very soon. I mean, it's almost incredible that you see that uh, uh, pathetic wheel and the, you know, the, I, I don't know the technical language for that, uh, uh, cover of the wheel and the, the back of that car, uh, not to speak about what we see on the left, and the building, in, as if they belong to different ages. The building belongs to the present and the future, and uh, what we see on the right and on the left at the bottom belongs to the past. Anyway, we move forward with strong belief in art and architecture. Unfortunately, we see here Mostra della Rivoluzione Fascista. Well, we get a problem, we have a problem here. But I guess these people believed in that revolution. I don't know, they, 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 do, they did believe in architecture because uh, um, uh, Il Duce, the leader, the fascist leader also believed in architecture. So, uh, 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 you know, they, they thought they would change the world for the better through architecture as well. I don't know very well the significance of that. Maybe it was the 20th, uh, those two axes, uh, left and right. Maybe the significance uh, is not so difficult to, to, uh, to discover, but uh, I, I do not know what they mean. Anyway, uh, move forward. Mostra della rivoluzione fascista. Uh, said, you know, in a way. But, but as opposed to, uh, to the Germans, who uh, advocated a, 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 diff a different, a very different kind of architecture? At least the Italians promoted some kind of modernism. In fact, it was modernism. Uh, in fact, a very emphatic modernism. So, as opposed to Hitler, who wanted to build the Grosse Halle in a, a pathetically historicist mode because he wanted to mimic the imperial power of the Third Reich. Uh, to mimic uh, the empires of the past through the architecture of the Third Reich uh, and with the help of Albert Speer, he, he did uh, what he did. I mean, he didn't have too much to do it, but he would have transformed Berlin into a crushing city, crushing through whiteness. These Italians, I think, uh, knew better about uh, aesthetics and design and they should have known better with their incredible uh, uh, artistic past. Not that the Germans didn't have themselves a great past in art, because I have the highest admiration for artists like Albrecht Dürer, or uh, to mention just one. Um, anyway, move forward. This is his masterpiece, besides the debated uh, Malaper Malaparte building, Il Palazzo dei Congressi, uh, and uh, uh, from 1938. So it was very close to, I mean, you know, the war was, was, was there all, almost already. And uh, the, he built, uh, uh, Italians love uh, uh, palaces of congresses. Massimiliano Fuxas or Studio Fuxas just built one very ample and uh, not bad actually in Rome. 
um, yeah, I guess they, they like these big gatherings and they, they like congresses. What can you do? You know, uh, they dress nicely and they go to the Congress. So this is, uh, I, I discovered this plan. I, at first, I didn't even believe this is the palace of Congress. Uh, I have another plan. But this is, uh, look at it, it's, it's so uh, cryptical in a way. I think this drawing was made for a specific function. And, uh, and uh, uh, I guess there are tables there or I don't know, stands or I don't know. But you'll see the building. It's right there at the, the end of the street. Look at the cars and look at the buildings. And right there, I mean, in the city where all the roads lead to, meaning Rome, as it is said, and as you know, we have an, a building where all the roads lead, and that's the Palace of Congress. And uh, it was built by Adalberto Libera. And it has some very good, uh, very good uh, parts, especially those, uh, uh, those uh, big uh, windows at the top. You'll see uh, a very nice, uh, uh, the very nice way in which the, the, the light enters the building at the top. Uh, I don't know exactly what is here. At the, I see some chairs or what are they? It's maybe some kind of artistic installation. Um, you remember now that, 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 uh, that plan right here. So at the bottom in that square is this space here. But this is a building, you know, built uh, eight years ago, uh, more than a little more, 82 years ago. And it looks still uh, very so-called modern, no? Yeah, this is a great space to, 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 to have uh, exhibitions, you know, or um, performing arts, dance, um, theater, you name it. Even boxing events, why not? Anyway, this is the light that enters uh, and, and hits the wall. Um, um, I would say uh, convincingly. Uh, I like this picture. Now those corridors, uh, those uh, corridors uh, on the first and second floor, uh, they do look a little bit like uh, prison corridors, but maybe even that is interesting. Anyway, move forward. The Palace of Congress. That's the balcony from which Il Duce probably wanted to address the whole world with his friend Hitler, the two of them, you know, uh, the, 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 the bringers of light, of the torch of light to the world. But it turned out that uh, their dream was actually bringing ashes to the world and corpses. Sad, you know, isn't it strange that you have the rhetorics of architecture turned upside down, you know, because I'm sure if the architects anticipated the disasters of war, they would not have built it so optimistically, that balcony from which Il Duce, or I don't know what leader, would talk to the populace. Um, yeah, sad. Sad, sad, because uh, any war is sad, and we, we, we must do everything we can to avoid wars. But it seems we have difficulties to do this. Anyway, uh, Villa Malaparte. Now Villa Malaparte, uh, uh, as I said, uh, the name belongs to the, the client who changed Bonaparte into Malaparte. And I like actually this because I also like to play with words. It's from 1938. And as you can see, secondo recenti acquisizioni documentali, il progetto è in realtà interamente attribuibile allo, allo stesso Curzio Malaparte, meaning the, the client. So, traditionally, this building was considered the, the work of Adalberto Libera, and still is to an extent, but it seems more and more documents are, are, are challenging that. They were involved because I read in the, in the interview with his daughter that uh, Adalberto Libera and Curcio Malaparte were having meetings in a restaurant that was old-fashioned in the sense they had paper uh, table clothes 
and they drew sketches related to the building in, in their discussion and that his wife, Adalberto Libera's wife, kept for a while uh, three such tablecloths filled with sketches uh, but uh, when they moved uh, after the war they 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 got lost those uh, tablecloths anyway it's a debated uh, authorship for this building but the building is great and it's great because mainly of those stairs which are stairs to heaven really they are stairs to the infinite now of course, it's a little bit intriguing that white wall curve, which on your way towards infinity, you kind of hit that wall. So, but when you are on the stairs, you don't see that wall. And maybe, maybe uh, it's actually not bad. Uh, uh, you know, I am tempted to think that is a little bit uh, contradiction here, because I know the client wanted to have this stair and apparently at least the daughter of Adalberto Libera said he had this brilliant idea to have a stair which is not uh, I don't know how to describe it starts narrow at the bottom and the more you walk up it opens up so this I'm sure creates the feeling of, of a truly uh, uh, almost uh, uh, you know being close to, to, to taking off like a bird because you move towards the sky and, 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 and the stair, instead of becoming narrower because of perspective, it became a little bit wider the more you walked up. So symbolically, what does that mean? It means that any uh, as ascension, the act of ascending, of walking up, symbolically uh, uh, has also a spiritual meaning because you are, you are walking up towards the sky towards uh, the gods in a way, or to God, or the angels, or um, the paradise, or you can name it, the heavens. And I wonder how many of our stairs today assume this symbolical level. In the past it was done, but in the present we do not think very often in, in such exalted terms. And I think it's a, it's, a, it's a loss, maybe a tragic loss. Here you see the plants. It's a house. On the first floor, you know, some rooms. On the top floor, a great living room, uh, truly great, with unbelievable views. I mean, the, the, the setting is divine. And, uh, you know, uh, maybe large uh, either guest rooms or, or the master bedroom uh, and some other rooms there with the bathrooms. And then the top, which is so important, and by the way of this, I don't know if you noticed, in China, uh, there are very interesting projects. I, it seems the Chinese love to work on roofs because I have seen very intriguing uh, projects where they, they actually climb through the bridges and passageways and you name it, on the roofs. This is very interesting. And uh, I actually think that it's a great idea to kind of reconnect with the sky in, in, a, in, in a different way than through airplanes and rockets and uh, satellites and I don't know what. Uh, I, I admire the Chinese for this. Check out this. Uh, from time to time, uh, Arch Daily shows projects, especially in rural areas, and even Wang Shu did this the great uh, Chinese, uh, uh, I, I don't know if I pronounce what his name, maybe Wang Shu or Wang Shu, but he received the Pritzker Prize and he also did a project with, uh, you know, the possibility to climb on the roof. Very unusual and very interesting. So here, um, yeah, maybe this stair, which goes up and then hits that white wall, uh, tries to temper a little bit the, the ascension, to make it a little bit uh, a little bit difficult or to sabotage it a little bit exactly at the top. And then when you go around it, you see the sea. And, uh, uh, you know, this is like a metaphor that what is, uh, uh, what is uh, worthy of uh, reaching uh, many times uh, requires some effort. Maybe.
or maybe some other interpretations are possible. But the setting is magnificent. I mean, uh, who wouldn't want to build a house in, in such a setting? We'll see the words of John Haydock, the one of the whites, the New York Five, um, the, the famous New York Five, the other four being Peter Eisenman, Richard Meyer, uh, Charles Guidme, and uh, Michael Graves, and the Dean of Cooper Union. He wrote very, uh, you know, emotionally in a way about this building. Not bad. And again, you, you see the dialectics of culture, of, co of color. You have the green, the green of nature, and you have the redness of the building. And redness and green uh, uh, are, are opposite colors or complementary colors. Uh, so uh, I even uh, suggest to you when you make a salad, uh, uh, and not just a salad, try to think of the colors because you can make a very uh, appetizing plate by combining, uh, you know, uh, various kinds of food also based on their colors. Of course, it has to be tasty, what is there, but also the colors can stimulate. If you put a tomato, red, uh, hopefully uh, near some green, uh, you know, the appetite increases a little bit, I think. Anyway, moving forward. Uh, yes, the, 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 the setting is, uh, is, uh, is mythical. And you know, it does look mythical and you see the, the importance of the perspective in reverse. You know, that you expect what is a little further away to be smaller and is actually a little bigger. And this is something that uh, is worth uh, contemplating in your own project. It depends what you want to see, of course. What you want to do, yes, to see. Um, but, <laughs> but, also something else if the architects or the client would have put parapets there it would have been a mistake now the functionalist would say wait a minute i could fall from there yes you could it's true but the but the stair is not so narrow so uh, you know if you are foolish enough to come too close to it uh, well you pay the price but if there was a if there was a parapet not just around the stair, but also uh, around the terrace, it would have been a mistake. Because you cannot climb towards heavens or towards God or towards the gods and then think of your uh, ephemeral uh, um, you know, needs for so-called protection or as Rem Kolhas called it, the, the paraphernalia of protection. Now, but um, yeah, Rem Kolhas can be sometimes a little bit cynical but in this case, clearly, it would have been a mistake to place a, a, a parapet. So they chose correctly, not to, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, also the terrace doesn't have a parapet. It might be illegal, but this is the island of Capri. So I guess uh, they, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, they got, um, somehow they were able to do it. Anyway. It is one of the great uh, houses of the world, really. And I, I read that all the big names in fashion would like would love to possess this building, to buy it. But uh, for, for you know, for some reasons, it's, it's not available. I mean, uh, uh, you know, they would pay fortunes for this building because it's a perfect setting for fashion shows. And you'll see an image related to this. Now look at these great paintings. Of course they are not paintings. It's a glass, it's a window, and you see the unbelievable nature, the beauty of nature. And uh, yes, the, the, the armchair, it doesn't matter how it is, you know, it can be a banal armchair, as this one probably is, it's comfortable, but it's banal, and even covered in plastic, it's okay. It's okay because he, 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 even the the, deterioration of the world or of the finishes of the world, they don't matter. They don't matter because there is greatness here. Uh, is the greatness of nature and is the greatness of the conception of the building. So it doesn't matter. These little details are just that, details. So uh, in 1980, American architect John Haydock describes Adalberto Libera's villa 
designed for Curzio Malaparte as a house of rituals and rites, of mysteries, an ancient play unraveling under Italian light. And, uh, uh, well, of course, the, the stair itself is, uh, that brings you closer to the water is, is another, uh, you know, positive thing here relating to the, to the, to the house. Um, so again, you are looking at one of the famous houses of the world. Uh, if there are 20 famous houses in the world, probably this house should be in between them or amongst them. If there are 10 famous houses of the world, I think uh, Villa Malaparte should still be there. Well, if there are five, I don't know, but it deserves, I think, to be amongst the best or the most interesting or the most significant 10. The Bera Smaldaparte house is private. It is a house of paradoxes. It is an object which consumes. It is filled with unrequited unre histories. It is a relic left upon the pinnacle after the seas have sub subsided. It is a sarcophagus of soft cries. It whispers of inevitable fates. This is what John Haydock wrote. And maybe one day architects will learn again to express their feelings in a poetical way and not just in an analytical and so-called objective way. Okay, some images from the inside. I mean, who wouldn't want to have such a living room? Well, now is, uh, I see an exhibition here and uh, you see the, 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 the furniture is banal, you know. Yes, comfortable, but banal. But it doesn't matter, the space is great. And those two windows uh, are, 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 are leading uh, the eye towards uh, the magnificence of the gods. The house that all fashion brands want. Of course, of course they do want it. As you can tell. Well, you know, if you have this house and you have some, uh, you know, uh, interesting models and you maybe have some interesting uh, patient items, you are set for success. They probably, the, the owners of the house, uh, whoever they are, they probably uh, uh, rent it for unbelievable amounts of money to these patient houses, which are uh, salivating for uh, having some, some uh, appetizing shows in this house. Now look at this window, you know, is it a window or is it a, an incredible painting by Raffaello Sanzio? What is it? Imagine, imagine laying on that sofa uh, now that there is pandemic and you cannot get out of the house and look at this uh, paysage, at this, uh, you know, landscape and uh, I mean, you would say, well, you know, uh, life can be beautiful even during a pandemic. Now, sorry, I didn't want to actually infer that, but you understand. Yeah, you don't need anything else here. You don't need, you know, you don't need even art. You know, the art is 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 made by the gods. You know that, and I I said this before. Frank Lloyd Wright was asked, "Do you believe in God?" And he said, "I do believe, but I spell it nature." Uh, a tree is a tree. We should take our hats off in front of a tree and in front of the sea and in front of the rocks and in front, of course, of the sky. Now, La Palazzine uh, in Via Pessina nel complesso della città Giardino. I, I didn't find pictures with this, sorry. So we go to the next one, L'unità d'abitazione orizzontale. Al quartiere. I'm beginning to like Italian. I think I, I'm, I'm dedicating my time now to learn a little bit um, Italian. To Scolano di Roma. And it's strange because I worked in Rome and I, uh, but I was an, an immigrant. I was uh, tormented. I, I, I didn't learn any Italian, although I could have. Strange. Il padiglione della casa per il mezzo, mezzogiorno alla fiera di Cagliari, 1953. An interesting. Uh, this picture is interesting, but then I saw, I think there were some additions or something happened to it. But here I see something very interesting and provoking. Um, 
Yeah, I guess it still is. I, I, I don't know. Uh, but I, I couldn't find great pictures and I, I apologize. Um, another thing, you see writing on the facades of the buildings. Uh, it's possible, you know, you, you can, uh, you can uh, and live in a building and even make some uh, whimsical statements, maybe relating to the function of the building or the socio-political realities of the time or a quotation for, from Oscar Wilde, something. And, and, and you just transform a banal part of the building into something that is not banal. It's possible. Il Cinema uh, Aroma, 1955, um, not bad. I mean, look at it. It's a, it's a spaceship of large dimensions. You know, uh, our friend uh, Kodruz would say, well, well we, we can put a whole village there and fly to the Mars with it. Um, you know, 1955, what cinema today would look like this? I don't think too many. Well, we are not building cinemas any longer because the cinemas now are in our, in our room, in our living rooms. Uh, the great uh, film director, um, Michelangelo Antonioni, he said, we are living in an interesting period of time. Uh, the, the cinema um, uh, screens uh, are becoming smaller and smaller and the, 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 the TV screens of, of our own apartments are becoming larger and larger. And it's true. Uh, and it's something worth thinking about that the social dimension of, uh, of, uh, of uh, public events is kind of diminishing because entertainment is now taking place in our own room. So we have giant TVs, we have uh, incredible LCD screens, bigger and bigger, but who goes to a cinema these days? Really, and not too many. Although I think it's different when you watch a movie or whatever, together with other people uh, uh, in a large room, uh, you have a different feeling, kind of a belonging to a, to a larger group than, you know, uh, all alone and morose in your own room, uh, trembling, watching a horror movie, you know, HBO horror movie. Anyway, uh, many cinemas in the world are, are, are ruins, you know, because, uh, yeah, they, they kind of ran out of business. Uh, so this is the plan of the of the of the, the cinema. Um, a little unclear the picture, but that's how I found it. And then uh, you know uh, the cross section and um, some diagrams at the top for uh, other possible sections. So I don't I don't know what's going on there, but uh, a good building. And this picture is convincing. Let us let let us uh, acknowledge it. Okay, he built a cathedral too, La Catedrale di Cristo Re della Spezia, 1956-1969, so 13 years. This is the building, some say oh, this is not a cathedral and it can never be. Uh, it's true, the ceiling is a little bit, I think, flat. Uh, I'll show a picture inside and that might be a problem with the building. But it has an interesting structure, and um, yeah, I, I, I do think the lack of some verticality is problematic. I, I, somehow this ceiling is, is too heavy and too, you know, it's, it's pressing on, 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 on the people there, I think. Maybe if it was a smaller room it would have been okay, but it's not. It's a large room. But these columns are interesting. Um, yeah. Anyway, so this is the cathedral. I like this picture though, but I still think that ceiling is a little bit oppressive. Okay, Il Palazzo della Regione Autonoma Trentino Alto Adige uh, Trento. Uh, I think this is the last building I show. Um, this picture is not without interest, you know, this uh, floating, uh, almost flying building. But then I have other pictures where somehow this is not so 
easily uh, uh, seen. This picture, though, I like as a picture. You see, the truth is, almost any building ha could have some virtues if the photographer is good. With a good photographer, you can take great pictures of, of almost anything, not just buildings, of course. But when you have a bad photographer, even with a great building, the pictures could be terrible. And not just the pictures, it could give you the impression that the building is terrible because the photographer was terrible. So in the case of a bi-dimensional representation, the quality of the photographer matters. This is, I think, a great, great picture. And you say, wow, what a great building. Maybe the building is not so great, but the photographer was great. You see, this is the build. Well, here you had a photographer who was not uh, as, as inspired as, as this one. And so, yeah, it's descriptive, but it's, it doesn't have any, anything poetical or, you know, uh, artistically interesting. Anyway, this is the building. And it's kind of busy there. Maybe if it was clean up, cleaned up and, uh, I don't know. Uh, it has some virtues because of this uh, large uh, cantilevered uh, effort but uh, like here when everything at the bottom recedes into the darkness you have a feeling the feeling that the building floats and that's uh, you know uh, interesting i think this is the last picture of of the presentation on adalberto libera yes it is thank you and now you are if you are still a little patient with me i can show you the work of uh, the extravagant uh, john lautner because he as i said he was um, i mean his birthday was today as well so we'll wish him happy birthday uh, equally let's say unfortunately he built just too many buildings i couldn't Plus, I didn't want to, 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 to have 300 pictures with John Lautner and just 100 with Adalberto Libera. I wanted to treat them kind of equally so Adalberto Libera would not be, be mad at me when we'll meet one day. So I begin the slideshow. Here I will also have a short video uh, uh, from, from, uh, from uh, its majesty Hollywood because apparently Hollywood loves the villas of John Lautner. La John Lautner was considered uh, a master of, uh, of uh, housing, uh, private houses, opulent houses. And indeed, uh, he was good. Uh, unfortunately, I made a mistake. When I started the presentation, uh, I, I began chronologically. Well, <laughs> I didn't first look at how many he built. So after a while, I got bored. I said, there is no time also to do because he built, I don't know, uh, 50, 70 private residences. So then, on the second half of the presentation, I chose to present only the best, uh, the best uh, houses that he built, and uh, not chronologically. But we'll begin chronologically. So he died at 83. That's a decent age to die. And this is the man, a big forehead. Uh, people say that if you have a big forehead, you are intelligent. I don't know. Of course, losing some hair helps for, for becoming uh, more, more intelligent. I am actually, uh, from this point of view, very intelligent because my forehead goes all the way to the back of the head. So um, uh, the forehead also becomes the, the, the what is the opposite of for uh, back hair or... Uh, you understand, John Lautner House from 1939. So he was uh, 28 at the time when he built it. It's not so spectacular, this one. Please forgive the larger spaces between some. Automatically, the, the, the PowerPoint presentation allows itself to betray a certain symmetry. And it becomes even more disturbing later on. And I have no time to correct it. But it's also playful in a way. Anyway, this is the house, but the first house, he was 28. Uh, you know, uh, Hollywood loves his houses and, and some good number of films take place in his houses. And I will show you a video, which I, I think will be pleasant because I'm sure you love Hollywood and I hate it. I think Hollywood is a cancer, uh, a, a cultural cancer. 
yes, they make appetizing films, they know exactly how to make us laugh or cry in order to make money. That's what Hollywood is interested about, to make money. When you read the you know, assessments of, uh, of a film, evaluations, the first thing they tell you is how much money it earned. You know, uh, I mean, that's why no great director worked in Hollywood. The great direct directors, including the American ones, avoided Hollywood. They have good, they have talent there, of course, but usually Hollywood is about making money. It's an industry. This is not a bad house. Whatever you might say, it's not a bad house. And uh, it's a kind of house that would be acceptable by uh, almost any school of architecture in the world. It's, it's, it's dynamic, it's not too crazy, it's, uh, it's manageably uh, interesting, so to speak. Sorry for this picture, it's not very clear what's going on here. But it's clear what is going on well. It's clear only to the extent that uh, the trees allow us to, to see what we see above them, not um, through that um, um, foliage. Big house for Ramana 28, isn't it? Now, the bell house. This is a, a, a house in Hollywood. He built for many, uh, uh, you know, um, stars. Uh, you can tell it's a big house. I mean, you, you wonder, is it a house or a, what is it here? A museum or it's a big house, you know, for people who earned a lot of money uh, doing uh, questionable work. That is uh, the kind of movies Hollywood makes, either melodramas or I don't know what. They have an army of, uh, of psychologists who know exactly which is your weak side in your uh, psychology. And, 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 and they hit exactly there. So the movie will sell. Uh, uh, this is extremely important. In fact, it's the most important thing. They, they cannot afford, they say, commercial uh, failures. So a Hollywood movie is made intentionally to have the largest public success so they can earn the largest amount of money. Not very noble aspiration, I think, for art, as far as I can tell. Anyway, but they are ruling the world. I don't think there is a country on this earth which is not seduced by Hollywood, unfortunately. There is serious culture in the United States. There are serious poets, there are serious writers, there are serious filmmakers. But America exports uh, commercialism and Hollywood is having a big contribution in this sense, very big. The other one being Walt Disney. I just read today, I, I've heard today on the radio, in fact, there is a radio station here that advertised incessantly the great event of opening up the Walt Disney uh, uh, world uh, near Paris. Can you believe it? Can you believe first that Paris, a very cultured city, no? The city of lights with a lot of history and uh, a lot of uh, great artists and writers and so on, built a Walt Disney near it. So then, this is the age we live in, you know, with Mickey Mouse, you know. Uh, I mean, I'm not against uh, um, joy, but that's a, uh, that's a fake joy, if I can say so. It's, it's, it's a terrible export coming from Florida, really. Anyway, another interesting house from him. I don't know very well what's going on. Maybe it's still, it's abandoned. Some of these houses, he built so many houses that I understood some of them were lost. In, in the sense that, uh, you know, uh, sometimes some, a new house by John Lautner is discovered whose uh, existence was um, ignored or uh, lost in the memory of those who keep records. Another house, Hancock House, Silver Lake. <clears throat> He's still here kind of um, low key, but you'll see some very extravagant ha uh, houses as we advance. 
Uh, this uh, uh, guest, uh, guest house in Los Angeles from 1946 looks interesting here, but I couldn't find any better picture. And it's a shame because uh, you barely see anything here, even with better eyes than mine. The Foster Carling House in Los Angeles, 1947, so immediately after the war, well, it shows, no? The, the, the swimming pool is increasing, the water is joyously uh, exhibiting an artificial color, but splendid. So who said life is tough? Well, not for everybody. Some people enjoy life. And, uh, and the home of the day certainly uh, accommodated um, the joy of its inhabitants. Okay. So there was a certain optimism then in American culture that now is not so present and with good reasons, not just because of the pandemic. Times have changed. Then after the war, there was America because it, it, it won the war and together with its allies. You know, there was plus after the suffering of the war, there was some kind of sense of a rebirth. And uh, this is shown in the architecture of the time. Um, even an architecture that is maybe sometimes, uh, you know, in a forced way, so-called interesting. Uh, but even here you see some interesting, uh, you know, uh, there is ingenuity here, you know, in this corner, which is sculptural, but also structural. Uh, it's not bad. And he's so different from Frank Lloyd Wright, you know. Um, well, is closer to us, although Frank Lloyd Wright was still alive at that time. I think he died in 1955, uh, Wright. So this building was contemporary with, with him. And the inside is not bad. And I think this is called the hexagon house because it has a hexagonal uh, uh, kind of roofing. And that's an interesting idea, to have a hexagonal roofing but underneath to have something um, that is actually not hexagonal. So there is a tension between uh, something that is not so geometrically uh, explicit and perfect and uh, what is above. Interesting. Um, okay. No, no, he has some qualities. And I remember when I studied architecture, you know, the magazines were publishing his uh, his extravagant houses. Uh, John John Lautner was a, was a star in the field of domestic architecture. And look at this uh, this uh, swimming pool. You know how it insinuates itself in the proximity of the of the, of the house, that curving and then rounding itself uh, around the corner, the, around the, the the column there. In it's uh, I mean I don't know if it's a column structural or it's just to bring uh, water from the rain to the, maybe to the, to the swimming pool. But it, 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 you can tell we are dealing with a, with a uh, skilled architect here. Now, uh, a motel, uh, which is called now the Hotel Lautner uh, uh, from 1947, which is not bad. You know, it's, uh, it's a little bit difficult to, to, to read what's going on here. Uh, there is geometry, there is rhythm, there is uh, vitality. But there is also a sense of um, reticence to an extent. It's a good work. You see the plan if you can, if you have good eyes. Um, I mean, better than mine. So it's a motel, motel. And look, in this picture, you see it better. I think it's fine. It's not commercial. I mean, the function is commercial, it's a motel. But it has a certain nobility in, uh, in terms of architecture. So you can make a good building even of a motel when you don't, don't let uh, commercialism eat it up. And, uh, you know, the, the, the cars are accommodated in a you know, visible but uh, also controlled way. Interesting because of those courtyards. In that sense, it's an unusual, kind of an unusual little motel uh, or small motel. Nice. I think it's a good work. And the inside looks comfortable, of course. Uh, anyway, life could be good, even if you eat up the resources of the earth, because that's what cars do. 
what can you do? Uh, we are ruining the climate, but we are having fun. Okay, so uh, this is the motel. Now the Jackson, Jack, Jacobson house, and I think this is the time to show the video. If you allow me to, I hope I can do this. I never did this before, but maybe it's not so difficult. I know I, I saved it. Uh, where did I save it? I think here. Okay, so uh, yeah. So ladies and gentlemen, we are in, uh, in contact now with Hollywood and uh, live from Los Angeles, we are transmitting uh, 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 a program in which we'll see some buildings by John Lautner with some great actors. Peace out. 
Okay, uh, back to <laughs> back to the PowerPoint presentation. Now you'll see some houses uh, that uh, you saw in this uh, video uh, in, uh, in 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 the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, and uh, I hope you enjoyed. I'm almost beginning to like Hollywood <laughs> now that we saw this um, uh, video clip. Uh, so I start from here. Okay. We saw this one. In fact, uh, the video clip started with the Jacobson house. Uh, and uh, I don't have too many pictures, but you already saw the film. So, you know, um, he has these interesting additions, you know, which are both kind of ornamental and structural and sculptural. And I think it's a very interesting idea, you know, to, to, to bring uh, uh, originality a building through these uh, uh, filigrammed, if we are to refer to what we read yesterday in the book by a great book about um, technology and construction and materials by Andrea de Plas, where he uh, uh, differentiated between solid construction and filigrammate uh, construction. Uh, and, 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 and you see this here, actually. So it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, you see here as well, you know. Uh, I um, stop. Pardon? Anyway, uh, someone has the microphone on. Please be kind and turn it off. We'll end up soon. You see, this is the hexagonal house or hexagon house. And you see the, 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 the hexagon, uh, you know, uh, in a broken line. Uh, but, but the house, this is interesting that the uh, portion of the roof is, uh, is uh, hexagonal, but what is underneath has nothing to do with the hexagons. So you have two different systems, aesthetical systems, if I can call them so, uh, superimposed. And uh, it, it, I think it's an interesting idea. It's harmony through contrast. The Wolf, uh, the Wolf's residence, uh, also very uh, interesting building, and you'll see be better pictures than this one. Uh, I mean, look here, you know, uh, you don't know quite well what's going on, but what is going on is very interesting. Uh, um, you know, uh, uh, this massive tree, and then of course it's spectacular, the landscape, because the house is built uh, in a in a special place and he's not afraid to use also stones and uh, you know to play with the uh, various levels uh, within the house so it's a good building and unfortunately uh, um, i don't know why exactly why i didn't do it i i found that uh, underneath this house a very famous uh, contemporary artist i think he's still alive james Tarrell, built a kind of a, a um, you know, an, an installation, I don't know how to call it, where he, in a, in a kind of a cubicle interior, he, he created two openings, one towards the sky and one towards the, the city seen from this uh, elevated uh, position, uh, in, you know, in the landscape. I should have, but uh, I didn't want to, in a way, to, to, to disturb the, 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 you know, the, the architecture of what Lautner did. But it's, I, I, I like this picture very much. It's, it's, uh, this is a building that is not inferior to, to some buildings by Wright, really. And it's, uh, it's very different from Wright in a way. Maybe not very different, actually. And actually, I think he wrote, uh, he, if I'm not mistaken, I think he worked with, with Wright for a while. Um, yeah, but you see, it has a certain viscerality. You see how banal that house on the left is compared to his? And not just because, it, I mean, not because it is smaller, but on the left and the bottom you have construction and on the right you have architecture. That's the difference between construction and architecture. 
construction could become architecture, but is needed something else. And uh, Lautner had it. No, no, he, he was a very uninhibited architect and uh, he deserves our applauses. Of course, he built for a certain uh, clientele, uh, uh, clientele, uh, so he, you know, he was lucky in, in this respect, but uh, we shouldn't uh, be envious of those who are lucky. And he deserves his, he, he deserves, he, uh, deserved his luck. Other people <laughs> less so, but he did. Look at this very sculptural and mysterious uh, portion of the building. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's great. Not bad. Somehow even better in black and white. Somehow. Bravo. Inside, I don't know, it's uh, maybe a little bit too predictable, but um, that's also because the furniture is uh, Plus, you know, you need a certain disorder. You know, if you let a cat there do its, uh, its job and you have uh, what I have in my own house, uh, the disorder will uh, pop up immediately. So you, even without the cat. So uh, <laughs> anyway, this is a famous residence by him because it is extravagant and it is cosmic and it is uh, flamboyantly believing in um, you know the power of man and the power of uh, uh, you know, technology in a way and uh, you know it's it's uh, it's a, a capsule it's a, you know uh, ready to fly to i don't know what distant horizons you know uh, yeah it's a tour de force so to speak but it's, it's, it's okay, I think, you know, and it seems even the tree kind of enjoys it. Uh, it's futuristic, all right, maybe a little too, too futuristic for my taste, but my taste is not really that the one that matters here. It, it's a building that was very publicized when it was built, and uh, I guess, uh, why not? You'll see another house where the, the supporting system for the house, the house is also at a higher level and is supported by, uh, if you don't look carefully, you say almost by nothing. Um, because it's supported by kind of a filigramatic or right, filigrammed uh, structure. I, I keep thinking of that word that uh, Andrea de Plas uh, used which I, I, I never encountered before uh, in relation to structure. A proud picture, no? But this is the, the picture of a, of, a, of a country that was optimistic. I mean, it's not the picture of a country, it's the picture of an architectonic artifact that exemplifies a certain optimism that was possible after the war and, uh, and uh, uh, the United States was experimenting and it, it had vigor, it had a, a strong economy and uh, you know, people were looking forward with uh, an optimism I wish we had these days. Um, but it's harder for us, the truth is. Yeah, not bad. Um, so, here are the sections through, through the building and uh, a more explicit one, uh, although less, uh, I mean, come kind of schematic, I like more these drawings, but uh, anyway. And this is the plan kind of predictable, but uh, I guess it works. It's not of, of, of one of, of, of his, uh, of, it's not one of my preferred buildings from his uh, uh, oeuvre. This one though uh, is uh, considered the, the works, uh, someone said uh, the, on Arch Daily or on Dizina uh, that this showed the bones of a god. Uh, it is interesting. It is interesting. I mean, look at the, the vigor of that uh, structural roof uh, that is floating above the, the living room 
and look even at the at the, at the length of the seating uh, uh, you know uh, pieces of furniture it is futuristic it is uh, uh, it is optimistic it has vigor it has uh, uh, sculptural qualities so i think it's fine it's a fine building um, and you'll see other pictures Again, we are dealing with with a, with a time that, that was very confident, uh, and uh, uh, I wonder what we can do to to bring back some kind of healthy confidence, not mimicked, not uh, not fake confidence, you know, not fake news, real news. Uh, and again, the power of the diagonal, you know, the diagonal that always saves us when we get too bored about Cartesian uh, obsessions. Thankfully, there are diagonals. You see the diagonals even in, in the design of the table, to an extent. And even in the positioning of the seating areas, which are also custom made. Of course, this is not a house, uh, you know, for someone who, you know, struggle to borrow money from the bank to build this, no. And look at the triangular uh, bed. What about that? A triangular bed. Huh? And uh, it's uh, also with those uh, futuristic, uh, you know, kind of uh, night tables or tables. I don't know. It's, it, 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 it's a unique piece and it connects with the architecture of the room in that corner. And you'll see it. Look. Now you sit like a king or like a, like a Maharaja or like a you know, Mughal emperor or like any emperor there and the whole city of Los Angeles is at your feet and uh, you know of course you'll have some incredible refreshments uh, on those uh, futuristic tables which, which are kind of close though to it depends what material they are made from I hope not uh, glass maybe it's plexiglass but they are a little bit uh, on the way of, uh, you know, uh, certain rebelliously positioned legs at some, some point. But it's, it's a rhetorical piece of furniture that celebrates uh, the joy of life in a, an obvious way and uh, breaks the building actually there. You see it opens, you know, the, the, those uh, windows uh, open up in the corner. So you are ready to... You are simply ready to, to, to start flying towards another planet. Not bad. The car is voluptuously um, uh, retro. Uh, and this is the plan. Not a bad plan. You know, that uh, it's... it's uh, again, you see, he plays in a very vigorous way with, um, with uh, using different systems of thought or the different aesthetical systems, if I, can, if I can say so. An interesting architect, John Lautner. And I'm happy he was born today, uh, and I'm happy that I was able to prepare a material about him. This is the, uh, the other floor. Uh, it's not very, very easily readable what is going on here, and I apologize. That, that's how I found them. And then uh, again, a few pictures of this, uh, you know, uh, assertive building. Again, the power of the diagonal, of course. And it reminds me a little bit of the train station in Rotterdam, no? <laughs> but this is a private house, although invaded by uh, cultural tourists, probably all of them architects or students in architecture. Not necessarily. There are people with uh, interest in architecture, who, of course, who are not architects. But you see a lot of people here, so there. So obviously, this is a big house. Okay, and uh, vegetation, magnificent as it can be. Uh, yeah, uh, life can be good. Garcia House. Now this was built in Mexico. Uh, and it's uh, no, no. It, this is not. Sorry, in in in, uh, in Mexico, uh, there is another one, uh, quite large. But look at this. How does it stand? Uh, I mean, you know, it's supported by those uh, <laughs> structural filigrams. Uh, uh, you know, almost the the legs of a of a spider. 
uh, and uh, it does, it, it, it didn't fall. And uh, um, the house is uh, adventurous. He likes adventures, obviously. He likes to fly. He likes joy. You'll see will Alain do it uh, very soon with a uh, quotation from him about the role of architecture or the role of architects. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. To put stone above those filigrams maybe uh, could be a little bit problematic, but uh, um, I mean, conceptually and aesthetically, but uh, I guess he likes uh, contradictions. All his settings are, uh, you know, it's impossible not, not to envy this architect. I mean, you know, uh, he built in the best places in the world, you know, it's like, uh, it's almost un, uh, almost unfair, you know. Uh, but I guess he liked uh, such uh, such uh, building sites, you know, and he had the chance to build for uh, clients who afforded them. I like this picture. Um, so, because you have again uh, uh, the meeting between two systems, if I can say, you have uh, heaviness. Again, I'm not so sure that that uh, uh, chimney, uh, so heavy as it is, uh, is uh, it, it is a little bit awkward that it's floating, but uh, maybe it's the, 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 the purist in me, or I don't know. Uh, no, he, he's a very interesting architect. He was. And the circular house, which is not so interesting, unfortunately, there is just one picture. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's not the worst house ever built. And again, when you have such a surrounding with such nature, uh, you know, uh, it almost doesn't matter how the house is really. It, almost any house in such a setting looks good. This is the house in, uh, in Mexico, and it's quite a big, uh, big house. Uh, uh, um, uh, it looks dramatic, no? It looks sculptural. Uh, in plan, you don't expect to see something like this. And uh, concrete is uh, seductive uh, uh, because of its thrust, uh, uh, you know, uh, character. Uh, this conglomerate that Frank Lloyd Wright was not quite convinced about does have, I think, aesthetical and emotional virtues or, or, or uh, uh, characteristics or values. And this is the, um, uh, the you know, the, the model of the house, quite a big house, kind of a domestic um, Guggenheim in a way. Uh, the model looked a little bit different than this uh, drawing, but uh, maybe it was, uh, I, I don't know. And this, we are approaching the end. Uh, uh, so another view from afar, it's in Acapulco. So we saw the Malaparte Villa and we see the Lautner Villa, I mean, built by Lautner, uh, John Lautner in Acapulco. So you, one built in Cap, on the island of Capri and one in Acapulco, which is a, uh, um, a magnificent, uh, you know, uh, destination for, for tourists. And now this is the last house we see for a, a TV uh, celebrity, a television celebrity in the United States, who surprisingly didn't build a, you know, a, a common house for himself, but an uncommon one built by John uh, Lautner. Uh, maybe it's a little bit too uncommon, but you know, uh, we, ha we are dealing with a flamboyant uh, uh, TV personality who afforded to build this house. And it has an interesting, uh, and I would say positive part inside a big opening, a circular opening, you'll see it. Look at this. Well, again, life could be nice. And uh, if you live inside the Pantheon, uh, the, you are an emperor. And he was almost an emperor of the, of the, 
North American uh, television. Uh, this is the house. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, you know, uh, I mean, who could afford such a house? You know, he was able to. And uh, John Lautner, uh, you know, uh, allowed himself to be creative. This is how the house looks like from the top. Interesting, no? And I don't think it's bad. I didn't expect this from Bob Hope, but when you have such a hopeful name, Hope, uh, no wonder that the architect promoted and Hope. The purpose of architecture is to create timeless, free, joyous spaces for all activities of life. And uh, as I said, working for Bob Hope uh, helped him in, in this uh, desiderata or for this goal. And this is the last picture of the presentation with the same quotation. We see the, the big forehead of the, of the handsome architect. Uh, working joyously at, at one of his uh, uh, many uh, creative houses and uh, maybe at this very house, I don't know. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I saw, uh, you know, somebody, I, did, I couldn't read, uh, somebody raised a hand, so uh, maybe we can start a, a discussion now if you want. Um, let me see, what should I do here? Share screen? I don't know, I'm, I, I'm tired. I, I don't know what to do. <laughs> Share screen? No, no, uh, we just... So, hello, Alex, hello, uh, Karina. I do not know who Karina is. Uh, uh, I know, I know, I know, I know. I do not know quite everybody, but I, I, I know um, uh, most people here. And I, I, I thank you that, that you attended that and that we said happy birthday to these two, I think, uh, good architects. So we can start a discussion if you want. That was from the stones. Then the column beam is from the wood and the walls is from woven from bamboo. Sorry. Let me check that out. Oh yeah, from bamboo. In the houses itself, it has only three rooms, which with different function. The front serves as a place to receive guests and bathing activity for a woman. The middle part is family room and for sleep. The bed is used for storing harvest. Uh, why I want to talk about this tribe is because they, in a couple of years ago, the government was putting it as tourism place and they were last week sent a letter to the government to remove their area as tourism. And two days ago, they have a response from the government. So it's ended up they change the word tourism into Saba, which means not tourism, but visiting. So if you came to their area, you are visitor, you're a guest. So you have to behave like a guest, that's all. Okay. That's all I present today. Do you have any questions or opinions? That was quick.